Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, I'm still Steve White, and I'm really happy to be here to welcome you all to hear Mark Sexton, uh, FAIA of Kirk and Sexton Architects in Chicago, and for the opening of an exhibition of the firm's work in the gallery afterwards. Uh, I really appreciate welcoming Mark and uh, two other people from the office, one of whom is still here, uh, John Roberts, who's over in the, in the front row, and Jason Zacherly, if I pronounce that uh, close, close to accurately, to the school. Uh, John and Jason have been here over the past several days uh, installing and making the exhibition with several of our students, uh, Michael Lafredo, um, Michael Orlando, uh, and I think those are keys. I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody, Tom Mitchell. Um, uh, there are a handful of things I'd like to, to mention prior to Mark uh, speaking uh, with all of us. It starts with uh, sharing a few thoughts uh, I've had about the firm from when I was an architecture student in another Midwestern uh, school in the late 1970s and early 1980s. I know that may sound remarkable. I don't look that old, but I, I must be. Uh, and goes from there. Um, Kirk and Sexton's work emerges from the tradition of Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago and Mies van der Rohe. Uh, but it's been a, a central player in expanding the vocabulary and in really opening up architecture in general over the last 30 or 40 years uh, with great creativity and playfulness uh, while developing an even more uh, an inspiring and maybe relentless uh, interest in experience and detail. Uh, I think in some ways it's probably difficult to imagine now given the way schools and the profession has gone over the past 40 years uh, how important and notable uh, the firm's expansion of that vocabulary was. Uh, at IIT in the 1970s, everybody learned how to, how to design in certain ways, and, and it was the same in a lot of different schools, but particularly at IIT. And I think the kind of creativity and evolution that you see in the work is really one of the great evolutions in, in at least American architecture. Um, there's also a, a, a strong love of architecture in general in the work and in their associations. I think we can see this in the exhibition that you'll see in a little while, and I'm sure in the lecture that, that Mark will start in a few minutes. Um, uh, Mark's partner, Ron uh, Crick, uh, made what was for many of us who were here a decade or so ago, I can't actually remember how long ago it was, but I think it was longer than 10 years. One of the more memorable trips to our school, the work was uh, certainly interesting, uh, but the way that uh, we were engaged and the way uh, Ron talked about um, architecture and making architecture and engaging with people and for the brief times that I've interacted with, with Mark, uh, it seems like a similar love of just doing it and talking about buildings and understanding things and, and not only from uh, how they may design buildings but our, all kinds of different architectures. And I think that's really one of the great things about Chicago architecture culture or hopefully things more broadly, but it's certainly a feature of Chicago, just Chicago in general about architecture, and, and Mark is certainly part of that, and I, I know we're going to see some of that, and I just want to appreciate that, uh, again, in the brief interactions I've had with Mark uh, and uh, in all the great trips to Chicago that I've had and some of you have had, I think you can feel that. And it's a great thing for you all to make the effort to bring that to Roger Williams. Um, um, and finally, I think um, with that love of architecture that the firm has, there's, a, there's just a great sense of collegiality with others involved and with people in general. Um, and just to point out, uh, I think uh, several people f uh, may have had Ron as example. I think he taught for, for many years at IIT. I know my brother-in-law, who's an architect in Chicago, did. John Hendricks uh, had Ron for studio. In general, I've, anybody I've known who's been in and out of Chicago, it's like, oh yeah, I had Ron, or, or you know, oh, Ron was great, or oh yeah, how's Ron, or this or that. And uh, I think that kind of spirit that came into the school and also the way that, that Mark uh, and the firm engages with schools, and, and again, in making a, a tremendous effort to, to do this here, uh, is really appreciated. Um, they're willing to reach out and, and bring what they do and share it and talk about it and, uh, and talk about any range of things similar or very different from what they do and it's it's really a great quality uh, to have and I, I uh, it make, means a great deal for them to take the time to come to the school so thanks Mark for coming and being part of our school and for enlivening things with us uh, and and being here so please welcome Mark Sexton from Crick and Sexton uh, 
Thank you, uh, Stephen, and, and students and faculty of uh, Roger Williams. Um, what, what I'm going to talk about tonight is what we, what we call making architecture, which is not, a, it's not an, uh, an original uh, title, but as, uh, as Steve said, we actually have a great love for the making of architecture, uh, certainly talking and drawing, but ultimately uh, um, the making. We've been, uh, Ron and I have been partners now for about uh, over 38 years, long time. I was, however, not a student of his. If I, w if I were, I don't think I would be uh, sitting here today because uh, he was a rather rigorous guy. Um, but um, we're, we're actually dedicated to, to again, building um, uh, pieces of architecture and sort of the thrill of that. There's a lot of tough uh, and sometimes uh, disappointing aspects of, of architecture, but one of the great things is actually to see something you work from the very beginning to the end, you actually see it built. Um, John, who's uh, in the front seat here, uh, along with Jason, were great um, collaborators, uh, actually getting the, the, the gallery completed. Um, the portal that you go through is actually something that is of right now. It actually was designed and fabricated in August. And it's something that we're trying to develop with Viracon and Skyline Glass, um, a new product that actually is an exterior pattern on glass. So you're actually the first people who um, will see it. We sort of loved whether it would be successful or not. We didn't really care because it's the act of making that actually informs so much of our, our work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to go through this. Uh, it's 38 years, so I've got a lot to talk about, but I'll try to make it um, understandable. Um, the very first uh, project, as, as Steve mentioned, was a steel and glass house. It was with, Ron at that point had a partner, Keith Olson. And it was sort of a, a sort of in many ways, their graduate thesis um, coming out of a five-year um, Bachelor of Architecture degree from IIT, this idea that this house could be very Miesian, yet had something else um, happening with it. It was no longer just um, direct. It had, it had subtle moves. Um, here, the frames are going up, and both uh, Ron and Keith were the contractors for the job. So this idea that you parcel everything out, no, that wasn't really the case, especially when you first start. So here, the frames are, uh, are being applied. Um, it was being done for a, a, a young man who actually wanted to live in the city, but wanted the aspects of sort of suburban life. Um, it's a very sophisticated series of, of basically rectang uh, rectangular forms brought together in a U-shaped house. Um, very sort of uh, obscure and um, even uh, a bit obtuse on the outside, yet when you go on the inside, it's light-filled. And here's where you start to see the intersections of planes and volumes and sort of the extension. Um, things that were developed, certainly by Mies van der and what we learned at the school, but really applied in a new way, um, a way like the next generation of architects. Um, you can see sort of the sense of really um, w warmth and uh, scale and proportion. Um, and w what, was, what was quite good, I joined them just as the house was nearing completion. I was working with Ron and the furniture. But it got the cover in 1981 of progressive architecture. For the older um, uh, architects here, we all know the importance of architectural record. It actually came out once a month, and that's the only way you got any information. This is an architectural record. Unlike today, where you in, in 30 seconds you can find any architect in the world. Um, but getting the cover in 1981, when in fact the whole world was going into postmodernism, this was quite unusual. There was a, like a modernist house on the cover. Um, so it actually sort of uh, led to our, uh, our career. Um, uh, several, several months after I joined the firm, we had a, a Thone was a, a furniture showroom, had decided to get five Chicago architects to do their showrooms. They gave each one of us $5,000 fee and construction cost. So um, for $5,000, that's what you see here. And it was really only about 500 square feet. The only requirement is you had to show it, you had to show at least one piece of their furniture. Unfortunately, most of their furniture was rather ugly, with the exception of their cafe chair, which is sort of a, uh, an element from almost the Vienna Cafe Society. We, we actually liked it. And here we had no money. We had, uh, there was no lighting, there was no budget. So we again, made this. The office fabricated all the pieces, uh, installed it. Um, we had to install it at night because it was all union labor. Um, this was at the Merchandise Mart in Chicago. Um, 
essence of art always plays in to the work we do. It's not directly copied. It's, it's something that's in the subconscious. In this case, it's Robert Irwin playing with screens and sort of uh, space and, and infinity. Um, so that certainly is a, an element of the design um, uh, process. But also we loved, we had no idea how this was actually going to come together. We had done models, but until you actually fabricate the whole thing and see how, in this case, perforated metal and, and fluorescent tubes um, work. And it was actually quite wonderful. The chairs almost danced through the space. There were lines in the floor and the ceiling and then these, these perforated metal frames and um, plastic pieces. You can see the chair and the sort of moray effect that happens with the, the perforated metal. You can see the chairs almost dance through the space. We're sort of quite delighted with it. Again, it was very small. Um, turns out that a, a woman from the Art Institute um, saw it and wondered, you know, could you live in something like this? She was so enamored with it. Seeing that we had no work, we said, of course you could. Um, and that led to the painted apartment. So it's a quite a, an unusual client who came to us, as you can see with this, um, with this image. She lived in a Mies van der Rohe um, uh, apartment building in Lincoln Park, and her children had grown, and she was living there alone, and she really wanted the two-bedroom or three-bedroom unit to be almost a studio. Um, so you can see here, we call it the painted apartment because floors, wall, and ceiling are, are all painted. The actual reference, believe it or not, this is actually a direct reference versus the Robert Irwin. Um, just as we were starting it, Ron and I went to go see the movie right after uh, Apocalypse Now that Francis Ford Coppola um, made called One from the Heart. It's a spectacular movie, totally panned by every critic in the world. We loved it because of it. It was all filmed in Zobotrope Studios, so it was all a studio production. Nothing was done outside. It was sort of an amazing um, sense of light and color and sort of saturated neon. These are some of the images uh, from it. We saw it and we were so blown away by it. We actually applied some of the elements uh, of it. You can see some of the paint and some of the lighting and some of the pieces uh, to it. So you can see um, see how, in this case, screens that we had used at the first showroom now become more animated because they're curving and we've got natural light on it. So we became quite interested um, in how they all work together. And again, because the woman was so adventurous, as she said, she, she couldn't afford the paintings that she wanted to buy. She wanted to live in a painting. And that's to have, an arch to have a client like that say, you know, her art was actually the apartment is quite uh, quite unusual. Um, and you can see here, we actually designed all the furniture. And I was the contractor, which meant that I was both the contractor and the painting sub. I painted the entire apartment. So all the stencils that you see on the floor, um, w I would work all day. And then I would go to this apartment at night and work all night, and then work all day and work all night. So I was working 120 hours a week being the contractor. So this is quite near and dear to my heart. You could see. The, the stenciling on the ceiling. The floor is actually pretty easy. It's the ceiling that becomes a little bit of a challenge. Um, but she was such an adventurous uh, client. We said, you know, we, we've got a great design for a dining room ta uh, table. Do you mind if we bolted to the floor? She said, do you think I'll ever move the table? We said, I don't think so. She said, great, bolt it. So it was, um, but we worked for 200 hours on those forms to get them just right for the chairs that were uh, there. And that led, um, sort of I'm going, I'm skipping some years and projects. One of the great projects that we worked on was Herman Miller because of the, the incredible legacy that they had um, with Eames and uh, 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 um, the other groups of, of, I can't remember all of them now, uh, but certainly Charles and Ray Eames as their, uh, as the great sort of uh, designers that they had used. And, and you can see here the influence that they had on Herman Miller is sort of in their DNA. And so what we, what we did is we said, you know, Herman Miller really takes a very simple material and elevates it by, uh, by proportion and connection and sort of the, its use. So in our case, we really thought that the showroom needed to change every year. Instead of repainting it, you could paint it with light. So you can see here we have sort of glass panels that we then um, sandblasted a dot pattern and then used that to really change the lighting in, in the showroom. 
Um, we have a model of this in, in the exhibit gallery. Um, the ceiling was a very low ceiling, and it was low because there were very uh, immense ducts and uh, that air supply. And we realized, well, they just occur at particular points. Why do we always have to go to the lowest common denominator with the ceiling? Why can't the ceiling sort of move almost like uh, you know, the, the topography of land where things affect it. So we came up with this very simple, just painted particle board uh, ceiling. At this point, this is 2000, so this is all CNC. So this is where the computer starts to come in and starts to influence how we make it. Um, again, for them, it was um, quite extraordinary because it fit into their the sort of ethos of Herman Miller. Again, standard products, um, and materials, but used in an elevated way. Um, we do all sorts of things. We do. A, we did a, f a plastics factory in in uh, Wisconsin. So one of the things that people ask us if are the, what's your sort of what's your specialty? We have no specialty. We do architecture. In this case, this was for a very high tech uh, plastics forming company that um, the owner was dedicated to really giving the people who work there rather than a concrete bunker really natural light in this beautiful northern Wisconsin environment. So that's what you see here. Um, the separation between manufacturing and the front office uh, sales and management was simply a transparent glass wall. The idea that everyone was working for the company, they had different duties, but they were all part of the same uh, organization and transparency. So this fit right into our, um, you know, our, our experience. and. You can see here the sort of young lady who's working at um, these these molding uh, machines. Again, most typically done in a in a dark concrete block or uh, precast concrete uh, warehouse. Now has natural light overlooking the uh, uh, the the beautiful Wisconsin um, sort of land. Um, this is a, a so it we extended we we started actually doing residential work and then started doing a lot of commercial, but we actually had an opportunity to do a, a residential project. This is down in the panhandle of Florida. Um, the gentleman's house had burned to the ground and he was looking to do something quite extraordinary. Um, this idea that he wanted a house that actually you, you couldn't see any light fixture, you couldn't see any supply, um, air supply. Um, no outlet was exposed. Um, and he, he wanted almost no furniture in the house. So we thought, Again, we're, we're very lucky to be um, graced with a, a client that has this sort of uh, vision. He had the land and he wanted, um, he grew up in Ohio and actually was stricken with polio when he was a young man. So he wanted openness, light, um, and sort of expansiveness. So he had this, uh, this house, quite an extraordinary house. We ended up spending five years in design and building. We actually were down there every week. Two people from the office were, were almost full time on the job just getting it built. So um, the building process. But as a as sort of a, a reference or an inspiration, it's actually in some ways the dune grass was so beautiful and how it intersected, uh, how both plant and soil intersected. We were very struck by that. We developed this. Um, system we called it sprouts, where the entire house is actually held up by these stainless steel sprouts. The idea is that it has to be 12 feet above mean high tide because of FEMA regulations for the hurricane that may bypass it this time. Um, so you can see the entire house is actually lifted um, on these sprouts. They're quite beautiful. Quite, um, they're almost like sculptures in in uh, among themselves. Um, and then, and then there's simply a, sim a simple stair that elevates you from the ground uh, to the to the house itself. The idea is that this might blow away in a hurricane uh, tidal surge, but the rest of the house would remain. And it turns out that it did, uh, just as we were finishing, a hurricane hit it, and he actually stayed in the house, which is sort of crazy. Um, so you can see sort of the again attention to structure, detail, and transparency is. Um, Another project that, we're, and I'm sort of jumping around, but it is going um, sequentially. Children's Museum in Chicago is a it was a quite um, an interesting competition. They wanted to to put it in the land that is now occupied by what's called uh, Maggie Daly Park, but it was actually a blank piece of property right next to uh, Millennium Park, um, just to the east. So between the lake and Millennium Park, there was a there was a several, uh, about 14 acres of land that, um, that 
was dedicated to park, but also could be a children's museum. And the requirement was that the building not be above ground. So that we had to do a building that wasn't a building. And it was a very controversial project because building anywhere along the lake in Chicago is prohibitive. You can't do buildings along the lake because of the lakefront protection. Basically, uh, Daniel Burnham set it up so that the entire lakefront is building free. Now, there are exceptions to that, Lake Point Tower, McCormick Place, and some would say parts of Millennium Park. Um, but with the success of M Millennium Park, this area became a very hotly contested area. Um, our design was actually, um, again, only after the fact did we realize it was inspired by almost a Fontana painting where we were taking the canvas and actually opening up slits in it and driving light down into the earth through these slits. So you can see here, um, again, without having any of the building go above grade, we could, we could bring light and openness and sort of uh, a pathway into the park through this. So you can see sort of these are images of, uh, of what, was, uh, what was produced. Again, we had about a 16-foot drop from um, the, the street that you see on your left to the actual park, and we took advantage of this. This is all, again, it looks like it's above grade, but it's actually all following the grade line. There's another image of that in the, in the exhibit you can see. Um, so this was, we, we sort of won the battle but lost the war because just as this was ready to, to go into construction, um, the 2008 um, sort of financial crisis hit and they were unable to raise the funds. So we've, we've actually got them in another location, a more, um, uh, a more frugal way of, of handling. Um, then uh, a, a project which I'm going to go into a little bit more depth, and this is Crown Fountain. If any of you have been to Chicago, it's actually quite, a, quite an extraordinary um, piece that we, were, we collaborated with. Um, but in, in 1930, this is what Chicago looked like, uh, the lakefront, the, the really important lakefront. You can see um, Buckingham Fountain for people that have, have been there. Um, you can see the Art Institute, which is the building. Uh, sort of in the middle, and then railroad lines everywhere. So you can see just how much commerce and, and uh, sort of manufacturing was the heart of Chicago, not so much uh, trees and green space. Um, again, 1930, as, as little as even 20 years ago, um, uh, 1998, it was just a big hole in the ground. This is really the front door of Chicago. So these are, it's interesting. And of course now in 2004 when it opened, um, it, it, all the railroad tracks have been covered, and there's now about 3,500 cars under this, uh, under this park. So it's quite an extraordinary um, accomplishment. And in our case, um, we were asked to, uh, to consider working with an artist by the name of Jaime Plensa. This is the little animation he did of these two twin towers, um, which were quite, uh, you know, quite unusual. Um, and, and initially, well, these are some of the sketches, initially Ron and I said, you know, no, we don't do other people's design work because, you know, we're a design office. But we looked at it and we said, this thing is just so unusual. And the artist had never built anything like this before. In some ways, it's sort of like working with a, uh, with a, a house client. They want so many bedrooms, you know, so much in their kitchen and what have you. In some ways, it was like that. So we started working um, with him on this. And then, of course, if you've been to Chicago, it's right um, across the street from the Art Institute, uh, very much in the center of town. It has been built. And I, I show this image because it's built and it, it is to look as easy as ballet. So I don't know if any of you dance, but ballet is not easy. It looks easy, but the idea is that what is it that, that we're trying to do? We're actually trying to make it as weightless and effortless as ballet. So I'll go through a little bit of what we call, the again, the making of this piece. The glass blocks, in this case, Jaume Plensa, the artist from, from Barcelona, uh, had this idea of this, these two towers with glass block. And we had mocked up, we had made some glass blocks or had purchased some and sort of started mocking up how LED and glass blocks work um, together. And so this is actually the form of the glass, the molten glass in a in a in an iron um, basically form uh, uh, piece, you can see. And this we actually went to the to the 
um, the foundry or to the glass shop and watch them actually pour these individual uh, uh, molten glass into each one of the forms. So you can see here, the guy on that, um, that lower left is actually the highest paid uh, employee of that glass company because he's the guy who snips the, the, the block. It's plus or minus 10 pounds by one ounce. So it's actually quite extraordinary. We had 22,000 of these to make. So this guy snipped each one of them as they dumped the glass in. And you can see now the glass um, uh, uh, cooling. Um, th this glass didn't exist. No one had ever made it before. We had developed the whole process and then worked with this manufacturer to, uh, to develop it. And then started putting it in front of an LED panel. The idea is that that Jamais' idea was that it was a fountain with LED and glass block. And I always maintain, if you knew anything about those three, you would never put them together. But that's the genius of, uh, of the piece. So we started looking at, um, on three sides, it's got an obscure uh, coating on it, or it's actually formed in the block itself. On the fourth side, which is the LED image side, um, you can, it's, it's clear, it's water white too, because we didn't want to impart any color um, into it. Now, uh, some of you, again, have either seen or seen pictures. When it's all done, it seems very easy, but when you're doing it the first time, not so. Um, structure. In this case, it sits over two levels of parking garage, and we have the computer systems, um, the pump systems for the whole um, uh, water system, uh, what we call the gargoyle, and the water cascading down the face of it. Um, and then we've got um, a fan system um, that actually cools the tower. So it's pulling in uh, air from the garage and actually cooling the tower because of the heat um, given off by the LED. And we had this great idea. We said um, uh, the Crown family had supported this. So they were basically the patrons. The city of Chicago would eventually own it. Um, but uh, And what it turned out, they had worked with a very large firm in the city of Chicago for about a year and a half and gotten nowhere. And they were going to abandon it. But they decided one last step, instead of giving it to a large firm, let's give it to a small firm and see if they can do it. So we were given, and we didn't know that at the time, but we had come up with this great idea. We were basically going to take the glass blocks, we were going to form them, and then we were going to put a compression ring around them in order to hold it in place and then clip that compression ring um, onto the fountain. We thought it was brilliant. We actually got all the blocks made. So instead of glass, because we took forever to get that, we made them out of wood, and we put it in this sort of big compression ring, just as a test. We pulled in Steve Crown, the patron. We said, you guys, thank God you hired us because we know what we're doing. We put that up, and we moved it a quarter of an inch, and all the blocks just came flying out. And it was like the biggest embarrassment. And Steve Crown said, you know, it's good that it happened in your office instead of in real life. And we said, oh, my God, like we were really, we, we thought we were hot stuff until that happened. And, and the reality is until you mock it up and go through it, you can do all the drawings and calculations and all that in the world. It's actually the making and doing it and finding out what doesn't work. This was like a fundamental, this is what led us to the solution. Because this solution, compression ring around, a three foot by four foot series of blocks. We were relying on the blocks and we said, let's do the exact opposite. Let's not rely on the block at all. We don't care about the block. That's counterintuitive, but that's what this failure did. So basically what we came up with is this idea of a grid. Any block could be taken out, vandalized, or what have you, the grid would still hold it all together. You can see here, this is a section, detailed section through, I've got a T, stainless steel T, that the blocks are actually glazed into. Every block has four, um, uh, four metal frames around it, and each one is glazed in. And then each one is brought together, and in this case, you can see the stainless steel grid system. It's really a grid system. You can see the guys actually laying up a whole face in a shop in Florida. The pieces are then shipped to Chicago with pieces missing clipped into place and erected that way. Corner brackets, um, the, the, uh, the offshoots here um, basically take the lateral load from the wind. And the gravity load is, is held by the, the, the large structure in the center. We've got a model of this um, in the gallery. 
And so that was, a, you know, again, quite, a, quite an extraordinary process. The LED, the system with LED was, it was, uh, again, it's now 15 years old, uh, 16 by the time we were doing this. We were doing this in 2002. Um, we were trying to figure out what LED would work, what was the pixelation, how it worked. We did a shootout. Um, Jean May is the, the gentleman in the, the leather jacket. Steve Crown is the man, um, the patron. He looks like a patron. He's got a tie on. Uh, and then I'm off on the side. So we're all working in our back alley. Ellie, this is sort of the technology of LED. So everything's sort of hidden in the fountain. You don't see this, but it's actually quite, um, quite a high degree of technology that had to be incorporated. We were looking at, again, two different manufacturers. So this is something no one teaches in architecture school, and this is what is the adventure of architecture. When you're actually working with a world-renowned artist, you're working with the Crown family, which is sort of the Rockefellers of Chicago, um, and you're doing something that's never been done before. I mean, it's quite exhilarating. Um, it's also quite terrifying, because if you're not successful, your name is all over it. So in this case, we started understanding, we just tried to figure out what, what was it going to look like? We had no idea. You could do all the drawings. So we actually mocked up a section of the glass block and the LED. And we put it up about 20 feet in, uh, 20 feet high, 25 feet in Millennium Park at that point. Frank Gehry's um, Pritzker Pavilion is still under construction. So we, we tried to understand. So, and, and you can see here again Steve Crown, the gentleman on the right of this picture, um, really looking at it. So again, trying to understand it. We actually then um, mocked the entire screen up in uh, outside of Salt Lake City, Utah. Turns out that the guys who were given the contract for the screens said, yeah, yeah, you know, part of the contract was to mock it up. And they said, you can come to our, our factory and, and see it on the floor. We said, no, 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 no. We're not going to see it on the floor. We've got to see it vertically. And they go, oh, no, we can't do that. We go, well, then you're not going to get the rest of your money. Turns out that their next door neighbor, true story, roller coaster fabricators. So they knock on their door. They go, hey, can you put this up? The guy goes, piece of cake. So what you have behind here at the very top, a roller, a piece of roller coaster. These crazy cowboys from the roller coaster fabricators got this up in a day and a half. We went out there and looked at it. Spectacular. It was in the winter. Jaume is all dressed in. I mean, this is the first time we actually saw the image of how big this thing was going to be. It also pointed out some of the problems. They said, oh, don't worry about those horizontal lines. You won't be able to see them. Yeah, we can see them, so they, we had to change that. So you can see that's the tab to handle the wind load on the LED side. So you can see it going up. Um, water features. So this was probably the scariest part. Um, Jamey had a, 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 just this little uh, diagram here. This is what he wanted to have happen. We, we, we sort of said it was a gar. We called it the gargoyle. But the concern I have as a as an architect in the city of Chicago, water is used to fight riots. And we said, oh, I can just imagine Aunt Millie getting blown over by the gargoyle when it goes off. So how do you? What do you do here? Um, Jean May, of course. He's just an artist from Catalonia, so he had no license. He couldn't go to jail, and he said, well, if that happens level one, that would be me in level two. Um, so he had a great, great laugh because he said, I'm just an artist. But it turns out that we actually worked with the, the people who were fabricating the fountain and actually went into their pool and actually felt exactly what it felt, you know, what it, what it felt like. Um, the idea was just a big shower head um, that if you get a chance to look at it, um, so up to this point, it's been now on for 14 years. We've never had any uh, reported problem. Um, and so that's what, that, that's what that piece is. And I have to tell you that I've never done the biggest water feature we've ever done is a couple of urinals and bathrooms, except for this. So this idea that you are a generalist and not a specialist is, is really what we try to strive for in our office. The problem is we've never used any of this knowledge on another project. Never did a fountain again. Um, so it's great, but you can't necessarily replicate it. This is a half-size model of the water flying off the, uh, the top. And we were concerned about almost sheets of water flying off with wind. Um, so we ended up uh, convincing the, the glass block guys to curve the top. So um, you can see the glass. So it's actually detailed down to the last. Uh, even curved block at the top of the, the fountain. And then lighting, uh, I'll finish up. Um, the lighting is actually quite um, important because of how you, you perceive it. And so rather than down lighting, which is typical, we actually uplighted it. 
you can see again LED uh, 15 years ago. So it goes through on the other three sides that don't have the image, it goes through this marvelous cycling of light um, that it changes the appearance. Um, the outriggers that actually support that grid wall um, get sort of highlighted and reflected in that. So it gives it some scale. It's actually quite nice. And then of course in the water we've got um, light that happens um, that uplights the, the entire piece. So it's actually quite quite beautiful. Um, and then some just some of the images of how uh, the piece works. Again, many of you may have seen it. If you haven't been to Chicago, Millennium Park, this is certainly one of the great, uh, you know, one of the great features. And this is what we were very surprised it had been taken over by children, just using it as the sort of the, the, the swimming pool of the center of the city of Chicago. It's amazing um, what literally a half an inch of water does uh, for uh, an event. And I, we have to report that even even though college students have tried to drown themselves, um, after 14 years, there's been no college student drowning in this fountain. So you can see sort of how it even works in the winter, which is quite wonderful because typically fountains shut down. Although the water doesn't work, the images and the light still works. And it's sort of framed by the Great South Michigan Avenue um, building. You can see opening night. And I think this, this image more than anything shows the power of, of art and architecture. I think this is what we go to school for. This is what we we labor so much to affect people like this, to have a real almost physical relationship with uh, with someone you've never met. Um, so, so that actually led to another project, a competition for a Jewish center um, just down the street. So Millennium Park is over on the far right. Um, this site, uh, which was a, uh, an open building site, um, in Chicago. It was actually the only open site in what is considered the historic street wall of Chicago. So Chicago has actually preserved um, this street wall. This particular building um, wasn't, uh, didn't have a building on it, so it was some open. Um, we started looking, you know, just from a standpoint of who was on that street, Louis Sullivan, uh, Henry Ives Cobb, um, were just a couple of very close neighbors. Um, in this case, Marshall and Fox uh, with uh, Benjamin Marshall. Again, Louis Sullivan with the Auditorium Theater and Daniel Burnham with the Transportation uh, Building. So sort of great, and we're in the middle of it. So this was our really first major commission. Um, and we said, you know, you know what, do we, what do we do? How do we look at it? And so what we looked at is this idea of a street wall, this historic street wall. When you think of the word wall, you think of something that's generally plum and level and, and um, straight. Well, as it turns out, these photos show it, it's anything but plum and straight. It's actually like um, every building is looking to get more light and more view into the building. So you can see these bays and this sort of, well, what, what I refer to as almost a vibrating wall. It's actually quite active um, here. And so influenced by Mies van der Rohe, the, the uh, architect that actually started IIT and was part of our foundation, um, we started doing the same thing, but we wanted to do it to the whole building because the building is actually fairly narrow, only 80 feet wide. We wanted to get um, effectively a 21st century bay. So we started doing um, the studies like this. And you know, our, our study process was really making models because we had no idea what we were going to do for the facade. We just knew it had to be special. We started doing, and this was one that happened very, and we just looked at it and we said, God, we've never seen anything like that. Wouldn't that be cool um, to do? So we started refining that. You can see here some of the refinement, model after model, probably in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 of these models trying to get the form. Um, um, again, whether it's related to cubism or not, it just was something that we felt that the facade could be sort of multiple readings of the same sheer wall. It was certainly open um, and transparent because of it was the only side that was light. Um, we ended up doing renderings, and we actually got this both approved by the Spurtis Board and the City of Chicago. And I remember going to a, a City Hall meeting, and they said, okay, approved. And we got, Ron and I got in the cab and we said, you know, Ron, we just got approved. We have no idea how to build this. None at all. And that is a thrilling, but we had just finished the Crown Fountain, so we figured we could figure it out. Um, 
So here you see the building as just an elevation. It's basically just a Cartesian grid. You can see how it's broken up into individual, I apologize for the, the, the size. And then what happens is, this is it sort of exploded in an axonometric. And so what you have is if, if you have a rectangular piece of glass um, that's flat, it's fine. If you take that piece, that rectangle, and simply slope it, you just have a slightly longer piece. However, if you slope it and turn it, as is every component of our facade, you now have a parallelogram. So it's infinitely more complex. Um, so that's what you start to see, and that's what we had to start figuring out. So what we figured out in this little animation is that, bear with me, this is supposed to work a little bit differently, that the mullion couldn't be in two places at the same time. So we had to figure out how you could make something and that's what this, we call it the Y mullion, was such a breakthrough in development. You can see here the glass facade is able to rotate, yet the mullion stays exactly in the same place. So we've got some image of that in the, so the idea was that we were going to do really just, just sort of skin and bones, very simple, just a mullions and the skin attached to it. You can see that movement in the floor slab, and you can see, in this case, the mullions going up, um, and then literally the skin being placed on it. It's actually a very um, extremely simple system. Uh, you can see here again, where you've got those mullions. Each one of the mullions has a specific sort of form and place, but once they get put in, the glass just simply clips into place. You can see them even dropping the pieces of glass. They clip in almost like a, a, a coat hanger onto a clip um, that holds it. You can see here guy caulking. And ultimately, you get this movement, which we were, were quite um, interested in because the building had to be both part of the street wall, yet separate from it because it was from a different century. The part that's part that is, we think, sympathetic is the sort of size of the glass, about seven, uh, about seven feet tall to about four and a half feet wide, which is very similar to the windows up and down Michigan Avenue, yet apart from it because we were actually having it move, the entire building was moving rather than just individual components of the building. You can see how it changes because of the light. We ended up putting a frit um, on it. You can see. So it's actually quite marvelous about how it changes over time. Um, entrance, development. But as much as the facade is important, but it's like a face of a person, it's really the inside that counts. And so the question we always had, you know, we were scared about and, and said we had to, what, what's sort of promised on the outside of the building has to be fulfilled on the inside because that's where, that's the soul of the organization. It's a cultural, uh, Spurtis Institute is a cultural, it's not a religious organization, it's dedicated to really the enlightenment and dissemination of Jewish culture and thinking. So it's a, it's a, it's a great institute, great um, sort of scholarly, it basically is comprised of, of an auditorium, a gallery space, a library, and uh, college classrooms. And our idea was to really put a slot through the building to bring, to drive light into the building. We weren't relying just on the one wall. The back wall opens to a 16 foot wide alley, so um, doesn't really. And then an auditorium that was sort of connected uh, to everyone. So the auditorium is actually on the lower part of the building, and the galleries are on the top part of the gallery. You can see, again, very, uh, very straightforward auditorium. Um, entry, three-story entry, so that as you walk in, again, what you see on the outside is you, you get more of that on the inside. And the auditorium is actually this, again, we took, in, in this case, plaster, and actually folded the wall of, of the auditorium so it became sort of an element that, although on your first visit you may not understand it, but on subsequent visits you realize that was really the back wall of the auditorium and sort of open um, to, the, to the space. And then the top floors, top two floors are very open, a uh, large opening in, these are the, these are the ninth and 10th floors. Um, in this case, uh, uh, 18 foot ceilings, um, quite open to um, natural light being driven deep into the building core through skylights. You can get a sense of how that works here. And then finally, um, the, the top of the building, one of the requirements that the city had is that the building have a base, a middle, and a top. 
and this idea of putting like a top on a building, a cornice, wasn't really, um, uh, it wasn't, it didn't work with how Spurtis thought in the sense that um, learning is a never ending process and that to cap it or to put a top on it was something. So that actually is something that we learned from the leadership at uh, this particular institute. So rather than having a top, we sort of carved this um, sky gallery or sky deck out of the very top of the building. So you can see it does have a distinctive top. It's just not a top that is as, um, as regular or as standard as you might see on the building on the far left. Um, and then I think this is just about the, the last, the last project or nearly the last project I'm going to show is a, um, a federal office building. Um, turns out that it's in Miramar, Florida. So it's a, an area that we'd never um, built in other than a house. Um, this is, it's about 20 miles north of Miami. So it's, it's between Miami and Fort Lauderdale. Um, sort of looking at the area, this was um, a competition that um, we first submitted and they had shortlisted um, our firm along with five other firms. The five other firms were Helmut Jan was in it, um, uh, Norman Foster, uh, Rex, Asymptope, and Tom Pfeiffer. So it was quite a, quite a, uh, quite a significant group. Um, and we started looking at it. So we had gotten through what they call stage one of a selection process. Stage two, you were to go in and basically talk about how you'd approach the building. You didn't go in with the building design because you hadn't been not given a program. You just went in and said, how are you going to design the building? What, what, what approach? Lots of architects go in and they talk about themselves for an hour. We were determined to go in and talk about the building. So what you're seeing here is really the presentation that won us the project. So what we did is we started at 30,000 feet, or maybe it's 100,000 feet above we realized that it was right at the edge of the Everglades, the, the building site. So it's always, so the building site, again, sort of dumb South Florida development. But in 1900, it was all Everglades. And so what we realized immediately is what this site wants to be, it wants to be Everglades. It's been Everglades for a million years, and we wanted to bring it back. So that was the first insight. So there's the land. So they called this 20 acres of improved land. So improvement in Florida is putting 18 inches of gravel over the Everglades, which is such a bizarre idea that um, we just said we had to do something about it. So this was, this was the land, um, this idea of improvement. So we asked, what, what should a 21st century federal office building be? And we went back to this great man, Daniel Moynihan, started the GSA Design Excellence. GSA is the Government Service Association, I guess. Yeah. Um, and they basically are the landlords for all government buildings. And this guy started, said, why, why are our buildings, why, why shouldn't the government buildings be the best buildings in our country? Why are they so many times you know, the worst. And so he developed what they called these guiding principles for federal architecture. And the great thing is, is to reflect, and this is like the first guiding principle, perhaps the most important, reflect the dignity, enterprise, vigor, and stability of the American national government. Quite, embody the finest contemporary American architectural thought. Qualities that reflect the regional character and traditions, an official style, you know, uh, Greek, revi Greek revival or even mid-century modernism is to be avoided. Um, and this is an amazing sort of last one. Design must flow from the architectural profession to the government and not vice versa. This is the insights that Daniel Patrick Moynihan um, had and then finally the development of the building should be considered the the site should always be considered as the first step um, in development so examples of GSA architecture the Federal Center right in the middle of Chicago by Mies van der Rohe 
um, and uh, Oldenburg with a, uh, uh, excuse me, Calder with a, with a sculpture, sort of great um, federal architecture. But there's also examples of not so good federal architecture. This is the Hegel building done in 75 when it was the middle of the energy crisis and they said let's just make small dark windows and huge floor plates. It's a miserable building. Or let's just make really, really, really big buildings with no landscape and put a courtyard in the middle and call it a day. Um, so again, 1976, not the highlights of, of federal um, architecture. So what we did is we went in with this idea, this, this is exactly the presentation we gave. We said sort of this, here's a site boundary. Um, the federal office building was going to be about 400,000 square feet. So if you're working on projects, you get it. It's a fairly large building. So there's the, the building. They had a parking area uh, for up to 1,000 cars. They had minimum setbacks. And ever since uh, McVeigh, there is a 100-foot setback. This is now required for all federal buildings. So that's just a given. It's like a new requirement. So, you know, but we said, okay, you have to embrace these things. You can't, you can't fight them. Um, so then we said, in this case, we, with this idea of sort of restoring the wetlands and the habitats and maybe even developing a nature preserve. That was sort of the, the sort of site plan for, uh, for. And then we developed and presented this methodology for effective environmental design. In the case of the federal government, the great thing about them is you don't have to convince them that sustainability and environmental design in buildings is important. They already get it. Some of our private clients, we're, we're always trying to convince them. But in the case of GSA and this, um, but how do you do it? And a lot of times they'll say, you know, let's put a lot of PV and let's put a lot of windmills on it. Well, no, not really. The way to do it is to start fundamentally with architecture. It's massing, it's siting, and it's orientation. That lasts for 100 to 500 years. So its life cycle is centuries. Building enclosure. What is the skin of the building? How does that enclosure work? Wall, roof, 50 years. HVAC, lighting controls, um, this idea of how they work, well, that's a third, that has a 30-year life. And then actually the last thing, although it's looked at, you know, sort of as a juicy element, is all the alternate energy sources. This idea of bio fuel cells or what have you, it's sort of interesting, but turns out that it has like a five-year life to it and it's still being developed. So you actually don't embrace this. So we call this sort of inverted triangles because if we say the cost and the maintenance of operation, those bio cells, even the PVs and solar, uh, 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 both solar and wind, you know, require a fair, a fairly high degree um, level of maintenance and care. The 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 sort of base building systems, automated uh, building systems, are very involved. Take a lot. Your orientation requires no maintenance, and that's actually where you're going to get the most significant impact from energy use. It's your orientation. So this is like. I hate to say, this is like kindergarten, yet most architects don't understand this. And I think that's why we, we use this all the time to re even remind ourselves that these sort of inverted um, uh, triangles are, are, are really important. So what we did is we said, you know, if we take a standard, a standard floor plan and say, okay, here's our program, which is space for people and core, um, yeah, that would be fine. But what happens if we push the cores to the side? The, the benefit with that is we have now flexible space. Um, cores are in the end. We have now an open, flexible program space. Um, we oriented so that the east and west sides are blocked, especially in South Florida. North and south can be open. Um, sun is high in the sky. On the south side, in those warm months, low certainly on the east and west, but blocked. So these are just, these are like the simplest diagrams. Also, um, blast is another element that comes in. So the cores can help with that blast side. So then we said the problem with this as a whole building is it ends up being just too, too dense. So we said, what happens if we break it into bars? You know, these bars that are only 60 to 80 feet wide, so that natural light, so that no one is more than 30 or 40 feet from view and light. So we presented this as an idea. And then we said, well, you could still connect the ends, so now you've got sort of like courtyards. 
And again, we have no idea what we're designing. We're just saying this is our approach. So if I take a section through that, and I start looking at that section, and I start saying, well, how, how can it work? Um, so this is a sort of, a, let's say, a three-building section. Again, we had no idea what the program was. But we know that there's going to be a secure perimeter. So what we said is, well, you have a secure perimeter, big fence that stops a 55-mile-an-hour truck from ramming into the building, or a big moat, right? So it's a very um, standard system. But we said, you know, look at what you have there. You already have your secure perimeter. We can actually, actually conceal your secure perimeter by using the Everglades. We thought for sure every one of the architects we were competing against, everyone was going to do this, right? Why not? You know, nobody did it. Okay, we were the only ones. We said it's like right in front of you, and this is a great secure perimeter. So then we said, well, what else do you do? You know, there's a blast. You still have blast mitigation. You know, maybe you slope the building so the blast isn't as significant. Maybe there's a screen on it that helps with that blast mitigation. This is GSA, ended up being for the FBI. Security is a big deal. Um, but we still said, you know, you have opportunities for actually um, supporting some protection from the intense sun. We, we had done something like that in another project. So you're actually seeing the presentation that we gave to them. This idea that you get a perimeter courtyard, that you still have views out, very important. So we're not covering the building. The idea of an interior courtyard, um, we said, great. The D is supposed to be after the R, sorry. Uh, uh, but this idea of an interior courtyard, um, can you take that courtyard and actually develop it in a way that the building mass actually blocks the sun, so you don't have direct sun coming in? So we could shape the building. And we had done that on another project that we had just completed. A um, little bit different, but we were using some of our past, um, past examples. Um, the idea of even some amount of uh, diffused light that would reflect into that um, is another possibility. So you can see sort of these are the diagrams um, we did. But the, the biggest concern we have is what I call the Florida, um, you're blind and cold when you walk into a Florida building um, because your eyes have been subjected to 10,000 foot candles and it's 92 degrees, and you walk into a, a 74 degree uh, building that has 40 foot candles. So again, you're blind and cold. So we said we were going to do something in our fundamental design, whatever the program of the building would be, we were going to say, well, when, you, when you're outside and uncovered in South Florida, you're at 90 degrees and you've got 10,000 foot candles. Um, but we could start by simply just giving you a covered outdoor canopy. All of a sudden, it drops the temperature just two degrees because it's not direct sun. And all of a sudden, the foot candles go from 10,000 to 5,000. We do a semi-outdoor covered area, sort of inside outside. And all of a sudden, we drop the temperature another three degrees. All of a sudden, the foot candles go from 5,000 to 1,000. We go to a semi-outdoor controlled area where we do some native vege uh, vegetation. We may, in, in fact, have some fans there to move the air. Um, so all of a sudden, you go down to 81 degrees Fahrenheit. You go into a courtyard that's now controlled, has no direct sun, and all of a sudden, we can drop it another couple of degrees and actually drop the, the foot candles down from 500 to maybe 250 or even 100. So that by the time you actually enter the building, the process of entering the building is a transition. And it's every human experiences this. This isn't something that only the young or the old experience. Every one of us experience. We said, hire us. And this is how we think of the building. Um, and on top of it, so we left uh, the, the interview and the, the gentleman from GSA said, you know, whoever gets this building, we want it to be an iconic building. So on top of everything we had promised, the idea that it had to be an iconic building was like, I said, oh, I walked out saying, oh, whoever gets this, they are so lucky because they're doing it. Two days later, we get a call that we won and I found out later the reason we won Everglades and that 
progression into the building. It had nothing to do with the design of the building because we didn't design anything. It was just our sense that comfort and pathway into a building were really important in South Florida. So that's something we had never thought of before. We had never brought it, but we, we got teams of sort of environmentalists and landscape people. We all worked through design ideas, and this came forward. So that's actually how we, how we won. We developed three um, separate uh, diagrams for it. And the ultimate one that, that actually was, was uh, selected was remarkably a three-bar building. This idea that the bars actually came back. Um, the bars ended up being running again the length of the bar. So south is at the bottom. East and west, the sort of very tough uh, orientations, are the ends of the bars. So we have very minimal uh, ends. And the idea that the site runs through. So you can see here. But in order to fit the program, the, the bars had to be 400 feet long. So if anyone's been in a building that's four, I don't know how long this building is. 200, twice as long as this. So I mean, that was the, that's the idea. Um, we then shaped it sort of like a road. Then instead of on a grid, it actually is like a, a path in a park that has some shaping to it. And then ultimately, um, that's, it became a two bar building with the third bar being the parking structure and um, what is a utility building, ba basically their maintenance building, because they have about 100 FBI cars, boats, and all sorts of uh, uh, vehicles. Um, and then, so, so the thing is, we were actually determined after making these buildings so narrow to actually connect the occupant to the site. But we realized, well, we have to do something with the sun, even on the south side. Um, because of the March and October uh, weather systems. So I'm going through here just a, a, a very quick animation about how we thought, you know, a glass wall could have this sort of screen on it, exterior screen, perforated, that would actually um, support sort of dappled light coming into, uh, into the building. Um, and you can see sort of this is what, what we developed. We love the form of it, typically where Solar shades are sort of horizontal and sometimes vertical, but actually this shade mimics exactly what the sun does. It rises low, crest, and then drops again. So we were actually just using the sun and duplicating the path of the sun on the south side of this building. You can see here. Um, and so what this animation does is December 20th, okay? This is the, the, the shortest day of the year. Um, in South Florida, this little animation, if you look at the floor, this little animation shows what happens with the floor. So I am getting some direct light into the, into the building. But on December 20th, I can handle direct light into the building. Because typically, even in South Florida, it could be 50, 60 degrees. So I can handle that. So that's what this animation shows. We were, we were concerned about how much we would put in front of the glass with these great so it's actually March 20th and October 20th that is the real problems. This is where it can be 80 degrees, 85, March break, um, in South Florida, where you actually don't want any sun directly in. So this animation just follows. Look at the floor again. You'll see tiny little peaks of sun sort of making its way in. So this was sort of the process we went through in order to design uh, the, the exterior shades. And the great thing about it is the shade was purpose-built, had a function, but ultimately really became the character of the building. The glass also, I'll get into, you know, this is what, as, as architects, you really get into this. You'll spend days, weeks, months, or in this case, years developing a glass. In this case, this is an insulated glass unit that has um, the outside, which is on the left side of this, is where we put our solar shade. So we get a lot of protection from that solar shade, but not complete. So we still put a ceramic frit, which is a dot pattern. We put on low-E coatings. These are energy coatings that if you don't know about now, when you start practicing, you'll know a lot about. And then ultimately laminated on the inside with uh, an RF-IR shield, radio frequency infrared, because it was a high security building. And that we were determined couldn't change the character of the building. So this is, a, this is a, a recipe of glass that really had never been put together before. Quite extraordinary, quite involved. Um, we got a call 
hey, can you tell us what glass? And we convinced them that we couldn't tell what type of glass to put in the building unless we put it on a flatbed truck, enclosed it in a structure, drove the truck around the site and looked at it east, west, north, and south. They called me up, the senior guy called me up and said, are you crazy? Well, we're not gonna do that, just tell us what the glass is. And we said, no, you know, it's a design excellence. It's the only time I pulled the design excellence card. We have to do this. This ended up being about $75,000, I think 12 or so different samples of glass. And it was amazing because we got it out there. And even the contractor who thought all glass was the same, just like all stones the same, just like all architects are the same, not really, was, was amazed that all the glass looked different. You can imagine that if we didn't get this right, the entire building, which was all glass, would have been a disaster. So we insisted on this. And it's sort of thrilling to go through these samples and to sort of see how it, how it works. You can see it being, it's a concrete building. You can see the shape. You can see, um, yes, your tax dollars going to uh, this building for the FBI, um, which is actually quite extraordinary because of, of, of actually the value they got um, out of it. So this is the finished, um, finished building. Again, just about 20 miles. You can actually see it from um, I-75 uh, on your way to, uh, to Miami. Um, quite extraordinary. Again, this is the front. Um, you can see some of the details here. We've got some more. I've got a model of this, uh, sort of a water feature at the front. Um, and then one of the things that working with GSA Design Excellence, you also have what is excellence in art. They have a, they have a art program in which generally one half or 75 percent uh, uh, 75 of, uh, percent of one percent goes into the art of the building and in this case we were on that art panel and um, the artist was Ursula von Zreidingvar she does these beautiful cedar sculptures you can see it peeking through um, the the window here upon the entry um, she's been exhibited all over the world, quite extraordinary. Um, Ron and I would go to her studio and we would work with her fabricating the piece because the piece was really purpose made for this particular lobby. In fact, we changed the entire lobby so that her stair, I mean, her piece was really enveloped by our stair. We had a completely different stair design. But she's a remarkable person. So like, again, this is sort of the second major um, artist we were working with. They're working together. She loved the building. We've become great friends and just working with her um, developing this piece. And you can see it sort of before and then after with the, the lobby before the piece was put in and then the lobby um, after the piece. And you can see it's like a, it's a beautiful sort of pulling in what is on the exterior back um, into the building. So what we, what we presented um, with our design, you can see here, um, these sort of two, uh, two wings of a building um, actually was delivered. Again, this is one of our images. It's remarkable that it's delivered um, like this and as close to our vision um, that, uh, that we had. But I think for us, the, the more important thing is, is, and what we're probably most proud of, is we took a site like this Instead of thinking about the building only, which is what architects think about, think about the site. Go back to Daniel Patrick Moynihan. The site's the most important. We took a site like this, 18 inches of gravel, and turned it back into Everglades. And for us, that's really the great accomplishment of this project. So I'm going to conclude with just um, two things. One is because we had done a secure federal building and actually was good looking instead of a bunker, State Department for their embassies had a big competition. And we are one of five architects countrywide that are doing, um, in our case, rehabbing of embassies throughout the world because we proved that we could in fact, it wasn't like in our and our first uh, idea, let's do secure buildings, but that's the world we live in, especially overseas buildings. So we're now doing, this is where we are in the world. We're doing every one of these projects as a project, a Crick and Sexton project, which in so many ways is what we 
had always dreamed of doing, affecting people. And in our case, we had never imagined that we would have affected people in Nairobi. We've got a project that's under construction in Papua New Guinea. We've got something in Buenos Aires. We've got something in Vancouver. We've got something in Iceland. Um, each one of these projects is, again, our vision for how we can make the world a better place through attention to materials, to attention to proportion, and to actually making architecture. So I want to conclude with our last project, and in many ways, a current project that everyone in the office loves. And it's actually very similar to every one of those high security posts that we're doing throughout the world. It's an organization called I Grow Chicago. It's on the south side of Chicago, and so many of you read about how deadly Chicago is and the problems that we have with our city, with crime and uh, just disenfranchisement uh, of people in their neighborhoods. So this particular organization is really dedicated to creating safe houses for young students, grammar school students, in that very difficult hour between when they're let out of school and when they can go home with their parents. That sort of 2.30 to 5.30 or 6 o'clock time, where it's very deadly on the south side of Chicago. These poor children didn't ask to be born there. They're just given. So in this case, there was this peace house, this idea that gangs in this area had said, OK, we're, this particular house, this particular area is off limits. We won't, we won't do it. You can see these kids, just, they just want to play. They just want to skip rope. We got involved with this organization. We transformed this house into this house. And in, in so many ways, it has a lot to do with what we do with embassies, where there's protection. There's a wall around it. It's not open to everyone. There's security. But without security, there can be no play. There can be no joy and happiness. So that's what this house. So what the house does, it ends up being sort of a catalyst of this whole area. One house led to a garden that led to an orchard, that led to another garden, that led to another house, that is now turning into a campus in the Englewood area of the south side of Chicago. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. These kids, after school, learn yoga. So in some ways, when you talk about our favorite project, when I see this, it's how it's used and the difference it makes to people's lives. Each one of these kids is again having this incredible wholesome relationship with both building and street. This never happens on the south side. But yes, because of this peace house, and you can see the gardens behind it, and the area is changing. This is the power, the real power of architecture. Get involved, get building, get involved in communities, get involved in areas that you are needed more than anybody to make the world a better place. So when we see this basketball court just open, we see the transformation of our little block. And again, the power of what we can do as architects, we're just amazed. So again, that's sort of our story. Um, and I think I, I end with this, because this one in so many ways, like the Crown Fountain and, and the federal office building, it has profound effects on people's lives. That's why we're architects. And these are the last two that we're doing. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions or, or I answered everything? Hi, Nate. <laughs> Has it stopped raining? No. So w what you'll see in the gallery again, I, I mentioned it, is, is we're really dedicated to making, you know, to making models, to making drawings, to actually being involved in the construction side. This idea that architects just do drawings and sketches on napkins and they're not in the trenches. The trenches are where the real fun is. So I'd encourage everyone to, 
to sort of see. And we, we've, we've dedicated some walls to what we call the, the big walls or some of our larger projects that we hope you get a sense of sort of scale, material, and detail. And then um, on, the, on the far wall, we ask some questions that we're dealing with. And we're trying to not give an answer, but we're trying to at least stake our position or point of view with this. So some of it might be a little hard to, to read, but um, some of it's also on our web page. But it really is, I think it's an extraordinary time to be an architect. Um, it's, it's a challenging profession because there's a lot of people who say no to things and they don't see really what you can do. But on the positive side, when you can actually influence people's lives and really make, you know, that's part of our mission statement. Uh, we, we believe that, we, that architecture can inspire and improve life. And I think that's what, you know, that's what we're trying to do. And that's what we're trying to do by making and by ultimately by making you understand the sort of essence of what the solution should be. It's not just an applied solution or something you've done before. It's actually something brand new, which is, is quite interesting because each time you do something new um, takes a lot longer, but you learn a tremendous amount. Sure. Sure. And John, um, who is in the front row, he is also very much a uh, uh, a spokesman and a and a, a diplomat and emissary for KNS. Thank you. Thank you.